Yeah. Yeah. So nice to see everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry to not be there in person. I was able to take a little time away this week. I'm going on retreat um, this coming weekend for a week. And I don't know about you all, but I often end up arriving on retreat pretty exhausted um, and used up. And uh, I had an opportunity to um, work remotely and be more in a natural setting before going on retreat. And I was going to drive in and teach and then drive back and realize that kind of defeated the purpose of taking this time. So yeah, thanks for being there. And uh, yeah, really look forward to this evening. And for me, a little bit of a throwback of teaching on Zoom. It was, um, you know, such a such an uncertain and challenging time that early COVID period. And then there are these like moments of it that I, I kind of miss too. I don't know about you all, like just that sense of coming together on Wednesday nights. It was such a important part of my week, right? There was so little else <laughs> that was refuge and so much else that was so confusing. Um, so yeah, really sweet to be together. So yeah, welcome to Wednesday, Well of Being. And this evening, of course, once again, we're, we're making our way through old path white clouds. And it's quite an interesting um, set of themes tonight in the book. We are, um, again, just to, <clears throat> for folks maybe who, who don't know the book or who haven't been in a while, this is a text that chronicles the historic life of the Buddha and really following him from his awakening through his early teaching. And now we're pretty kind of far along into, let's say, the mid part of his teaching where he has a great number of senior disciples. So students who've been studying with him a long time, many of whom have attained realization. And he is moving through all of these different phases of life and encountering people along the way, which bring forth kind of a new way of understanding the teachings. It's pretty interesting. I myself, <laughs> you know, when you think about learning from Buddhist texts, when you think about offering from Buddhist texts, it's not like that elaborate. Well, Tibetan Buddhism is quite elaborate, but it's not as though the main core teachings um, are that distinct. They're the same teachings over and over. And yet, it's when we meet with new people, new circumstances, either ourselves um, or with others, that they kind of take on a new feeling. And you see this very truly um, in this book where <clears throat> the Buddha is, you know, encountering all of these different people and all these different phases of life and trying to just say the same teachings of impermanence, interdependence over and over and over um, in different ways. And I myself need to hear it over, over and over. So that makes me feel good that that's also part of the core teachings. And tonight, um, some of the teachings we'll be covering are around the way that, the way that essentially theory can prevent us from understanding our direct experience. So I, I think about that in our modern context and there are so many different philosophies and approaches for seeking well-being, right? There are so many ways, many of us, um, myself included, have sought to kind of understand myself, to better myself. Maybe I'm looking at attachment theory. Maybe I'm looking at, um, you know, deeper understanding of embodied trauma. Uh, there's so many ways for us to understand our, our challenges and our difficulty. And yet sometimes those, those methods or those tools themselves become like a net that holds us back, right? We get so identified with this way of understanding or this idea of what our root problems are or challenges are that actually we miss out um, on just experiencing ourselves and understanding from kind of within the challenges. So that's a lot of the theme of the teachings tonight. And interesting to bring it forth into our contemporary times. So we'll start with uh, practice. We started last week returning to the settling of the mind in its natural state. Such a beautiful and um, 
I'd say true refuge practice. And I'd like us to return again to that practice. So as some of you may remember the settling of the mind, settling of the mind in its natural state is a practice in which we go through and really feel a sense of settling the body, right? And we kind of did this step-by-step, step. what is it like for the body to feel settled? You know, the body feel at ease, the body feels stable and present. And settling our speech. And again, this one can feel so vague. What does it mean to settle our speech, right? Of course, unless you're me, you're not talking through the meditation. But this idea that there's a quality we can connect with, a natural quality of silence, a natural quality of not only not speaking externally, but inviting just this kind of quieting and turning down internally. And from this kind of settling of ease and stability in the body, this silence that we're inviting through our speech, there's almost a natural rising up, this natural rising of a mind that is luminous, that is, feels vast and open. So those are the three qualities we start off on. And then when we settle the mind, we do something that is a little bit unusual, which is we allow thoughts. We don't try to push them away. They're not a problem, but we also don't energize our thoughts. The metaphors I offered last week from, um, from Alan Wallace and other great teachers, this idea of can we find a way of being with the constant movement of the mind in the same way that we see like a hawk hiding against the wind, not being moved by the wind, but just there, stable, steady. Um, so I think that's one beautiful metaphor. And, you know, there's another one I, I didn't offer last week, but one that I have found quite useful, almost imagining, you know, as we are observing the mind, right? We're observing the mind, almost as though we're observing the stage of a theater. And in that stage, certain actors come front behind the curtains, and then they go back away. And we can almost imagine our thoughts like that. Our thoughts, some of them coming to the forefront, the front of the stage. But then we allow them to go back into the curtain. We don't get caught up and focus on them and kind of lose a whole sense of we're sitting in a seat and there's a screen in front of us or there's the theater in front of us. So settling the mind in its natural state, it gives us this really essential tool of developing meta-awareness an ability to be aware of our thoughts, our feelings, the memories and images that arise. You know, in, in the Buddhist context, thought also encompasses so many different mental formations. Thought includes, you know, these kind of mini fantasies of something we're hoping to do later or something we're excited about. It includes emotional states, of all of a sudden realizing we feel anxious or frustrated. There's so many different qualities of thoughts. And last week when we practiced together, some people noticed that even these thoughts can have a little bit of a different um, kind of pull on us. Some of the thoughts feel a bit more like slow or laggy. They just kind of limp through. Other thoughts just, they arise so bright, so you know compelling for us. So we get really curious about the thoughts. And in this way, as we're settling the mind in its natural state, we can really feel a sense of calm and ease. And the calm and ease is our awareness. And the thoughts are coming through our awareness, but the thoughts are not the entirety of our awareness. So right now I am wonderfully surprised that out this window I can see the full moon rising. And in front of that, or not full moon, but almost full moon, there are clouds that are passing across it. Right? It's cloudy, there's fog tonight. But that luminous presence of the moon, it doesn't matter how many clouds pass by. So really that such a common and wonderful metaphor of the spaciousness of our awareness, you know, just bright and radiant and whatever passes by doesn't actually injure it, doesn't obscure it, doesn't scar it. It just temporarily um, gets in the way. So we want to have our resting attention and awareness in that more luminous quality so that these thoughts can come and go. And I mean, it is so useful to develop this quality and skill 
so many of us, one of the things we'd like to change most is not reacting. You know, it's not not feeling, but not reacting. And it's impossible for us to not react if we aren't aware of what's going on in our mind. We aren't aware of those thoughts and memories and images as they arise. So this is truly an incredible training as well as can be a state that feels really enjoyable. Maybe not bliss, maybe not like the jhana states, but settling our mind, it's a natural nourishment and refreshment. We can start to feel more at ease. Again, not by banishing the thoughts, they're not going anywhere, but not putting them as the focus. So, <clears throat> as usual, really long preamble. I hope it's useful. Any any questions about this practice, especially for folks who practiced it last week? Anything you want to clarify before we do another round of settling the mind in its natural state? I know it's a little hard. I know some folks said last week it was a little challenging. Um, I think what I can say to that is, yeah, it's, it's, it's a practice and it does not matter how many times you get carried away as long as you can come back. One thing um, also is we do this practice with our eyes open and that that's tough for some folks. Um, it's very different. It's unusual. So I'll give you options to close your eyes, but that open eye can really give us such an interesting quality. It really allows us to start breaking down the barrier between awareness is in here and the world is out there. And also, um, I know it's late, right? And it's getting darker earlier and it can be easy to feel sleepy. So it's really nice to keep the brightness of our practice in this way. Yes, I see a hand. Yes, uh, questions. Uh, okay, so, oh yeah. Um, I won't yell. I don't need to yell. Um, so I was wondering if we needed, uh, if, if there's a difference between wearing glasses or not wearing glasses, because I mean, um, often I can keep my eyes open if my glasses are off because then I can't focus on anything. But I mean, is it better to be able to focus on things and then have the option of not, or I don't know. I, I was, I've been thinking about that. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good question. Actually. I mean, this would be a really great time to not wear glasses and it's a total useful cheat in a way um, to have you. <laughs> I saw someone else take out the glasses. Yeah, really. Cause to not be distracted and to have that soft focus that's what all of us are, are wanting to do. And what's interesting, um, Ryan Redman, who sometimes um, joins us here for these evening sessions, he wears a thing called a mind fold when he does open eye meditation. And it's like a blindfold, but there's like kind of this like foamy cushion so that it's, you know, you get like a little bit of space. So that's his cheat, right? So he has his eyes open, but it's actually really dark. Um, in there. And so whatever can help with that. Again, I mentioned um, in a room with other people, it can be hard. So sometimes I'll put my gaze lower than I would if I was just meditating, you know, uh, with a more open view or vista. Yeah. Did I see another hand? Yes. Um, yeah, I was just, um, we should talk a, just a tiny bit more. I don't want to hold everything up, but about your mind being luminous, because I love that image, but I don't feel like I necessarily <laughs> achieve that state very often. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the words absolutely will fail. Um, there is a quality, and, and I bet everyone has experienced it at some point when probably in the morning after your first cup of coffee when there's kind of like this buoyant feeling you know like there's this sense of um it's not like agitated excitement but you're not sleepy it's this brightness but you're not feeling kind of tight with the bright and it's almost as though yeah you know again 
um, this evening when, when you leave the center, like look at the moon and see that quality. The, the moon has such an interesting quality. You know, the sun is warm, it's bright, it's radiant. We wouldn't want our mind necessarily to be like the sun. That'd be a little intense. But that luminous quality, you hear it so much talked about in, in the Buddhist tradition and, and other contemplative traditions, because the moon has this, this quality of brightness, but without kind of being overwhelming. And when we use metaphor, you know, metaphors are so lovely. Um, they can be confusing. So it's not as though we want to, okay, like, can I see the moon in my mind? Or is my mind like exactly the moon? But more, it's like truly the poetic quality. And sometimes, and it's beautiful, and if that kind of touched you, then there might be just a, um, a way of kind of recognition. So when your mind has that quality, there's a knowing like, oh, <laughs> this is what she meant. I know what that means. So no, beautiful question. Thank you so much. Really appreciate the questions. I'm sure everybody does. All the people with glasses in the room certainly are benefiting right now. Yeah. <laughs> you probably need it later. I wouldn't throw them totally away. Um, any other questions before we get started in our settling of the mind? All right. You hear? I think I even figured out how you can hear the bell. Zoom makes it a little tough these days. <clears throat> hmm. So beginning by feeling that sense of turning inward and tuning inward by allowing the eyes to gently be closed. And as we close the eyes, often just naturally, our breath will slow a little bit. Maybe even our face softens a bit. And find a posture that feels supportive. It really has the dignity of this meditation the digni dignity of trying and applying ourselves to strengthen the heart and the mind and the body. Finding a sense of uprightness through the spine. Really feeling the crown of the head lifting towards the sky. Softening through the eyes, softening through the heart. Allowing the chin to be just gently tilted downward. Let's begin this evening remembering why we come here to practice. And the classic remembrances, it invites us to reflect on what we can uniquely learn and take refuge in through the practice by highlighting just some of the simple truths of life. This remembrance begins with remembering that everything is impermanent. Everyone, every being, including ourselves. We'll start this life 
And of course, this life will come to an end. And with the remembrance that every single one of our actions, our behaviors, our thoughts, our speech, it has an impact. We are planting the seeds today of what we will be living into over the next days, weeks, and years. This remembering that this precious human life is so rare. The right conditions and the supportive causes that allow us to learn and transform. It's feeling the preciousness. And remembering that when we seek refuge in samsara, in the everyday's highs and lows, the constant cycle of shifts and changes, that we will not find refuge. We will find disappointment and struggle amid the other qualities of temporary joy, well-being. And that means it's no problem to seek joy, but to really know its limit, to really understand the true causes of happiness, the true causes of suffering. And with these remembrances, Somber though they may feel, they might ignite our bodhicitta, a desire for our heart to awaken for the sake of all beings and for our own heart. Now shifting our attention and awareness into the body and settling into the body in its natural state. Giving ourselves free range to explore the sensations throughout the body. Feel or imagine the body with qualities of ease, stability. Feeling this body like a mountain. Feeling the stillness of the mountain, the solidity of the mountain, 
A couple breaths, just feeling the body in this stable, solid, and still presence. <laughs> Shifting now to settle the speech into a natural state of silence. It can be helpful for us to connect with this sense of silence by more closely following the breath, giving our mind one place to be and allowing the mind to fully follow the breath. Like the rider on the horse, the mind follows the breath through inhale and exhale. Allowing the breath to be totally natural. No need to extend the breath any longer or force it. But also paying a little closer attention, noticing the breath and as it travels in, noticing if it feels long or short. And as the breath travels out, noticing does the breath feel long or short. Just as when the body is stable and still, there's still undulation, movement and energy within it. When the speech is silent, there may still be some internal chatter, but it's not the focus and it is being turned down. Settling the mind into its natural state, luminous, open, at ease. When the body feels relaxed, stable, present, the inner speech silenced and soft. This naturalness of the luminous open mind may 
just occur without even trying. So no need to effort here, just relax into, open into a state of more spacious awareness. And as we apply now our mindfulness to the mind more fully, allowing our eyes to be softly open, not focusing anywhere in particular. And with our mindfulness, there is always this capacity of introspection becoming aware when we have become distracted, caught up in grasping or aversion. And noticing what thoughts come quickly, carry us away. And what thoughts might arrive and slowly make their way through our awareness. If it's helpful using this metaphor and image of the thoughts coming in front of the curtain on the stage, and then returning again behind the curtain, allowing the thoughts to simply flow. And then engaging our introspection to notice when we've been carried away and return to a more relaxed state of our awareness. And balancing here just enough relaxation so everything can flow naturally with enough brightness so that we can precisely see and be vivid in our knowing of thoughts as they pass through. Checking in on the body, making sure there's still a sense of ease and stability. And the body that feels pliant and at ease will help the mind also feel pliant and at ease.
and may feel as though the thoughts are a steady stream, no gaps in between. But consider the possibility that there is something between these thoughts and around these thoughts, and even permeating these thoughts in the greater space of our awareness. And there may be moments where we get a glimpse, a full breath or two, just resting in awareness. And then the next thought comes, we watch it appear and return back from where it came, like the wave returning back into the ocean. And you can try allowing the eyes to gently close. Noticing the difference of awareness and thoughts that arise with the eyes closed. And then returning to softly opening the eyes, readjusting here. The gaze should be so soft, not looking, not searching, just this gentle seeing. Just a little longer here. It doesn't matter how many times the mind gets carried away. Keep coming back and strengthening this ability to 
rest and awareness. You mindfully observe the thoughts coming and going without becoming involved or engaged or carried away. Gently closing the eyes if they have been open still. Regathering the attention inward to the body. Again, gently following the breath. Thank you for your practice. Would love to hear your thoughts and um, questions. Oh, there's a weird echo. Um, yeah, he is echoing, I think, in the Dharma Collective. So am I for that matter. Can you hear me? Yeah. Was it echoing the whole meditation? No. Oh, man, that would have been <laughs> a totally different type of practice. Um, okay. Yeah, any any thoughts, questions, reflections on that practice? Sadly, you're muted, but I see a mic in hand. We'll see if it echoes. Okay. Yeah, I had this... Um, the stage metaphor was really helpful for me. Um, I experienced many failures and returns, but one thing, the re one of the reasons it was helpful for me is because I used to do a lot of improv. And so the stage metaphor in my brain turned into that when you're doing improv, you are on the side of the stage watching, like waiting for the moment to jump in for your turn. 
And there was this thing of like eagerly jumping in too early or like missing the moment. And the only way that it, and, and you're like, there's people around you and like, oh, I want to jump in. But what if they want to jump in before I do, or I don't want to step on their toes, or I want to jump in before they do. And I couldn't help identifying the thoughts as me in those moments where like the thoughts are so eager, they want to jump in. But if they slow down, then they'll be on stage at just the right moment. And at the right moment, they'll kind of edit and leave. And so I was picturing, experiencing myself like in the audience and there's all these thoughts on either side. They're like eagerly trying to like jump over each other. But if they can just get to the point where they'll like come in at the right time, because they're not stressed about it and they'll like come on stage, I'll give their little performance and I can be like, oh, that was good. And they'll like go off back off stage then hmm. there'll be some kind of peace to it. Hmm. And there's a weirdness of like, what happens when the stage is empty? What is the stage? Which I tried not to think about because that was <laughs> a thought. But now I can't stop thinking about. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. I love that. And I think a little bit of imagination and creativity, you know, can go a long way in our practice. It, it doesn't have to be too rigid. You know, um, I think it was good to catch yourself on, wait, what is the stage? Wait, that's a thought. Because um, it can be a little tricky. Um, but I, I think it's, and I do, I, I don't know if you experienced this, <clears throat> Raph, but like, you can also just notice that, um, like, the thoughts are different. They're different in quality. They're coming from different, almost feels different places. Um, and that is really helpful if we become curious about, you know, these different thoughts angling in for their time on stage, we are going to be able to identify them more easily and, and see them for what they are, right? Which is not the totality of our experience, just something that's happening in our experience. Thank you for sharing. Other reflections or questions, thoughts? Hi, Eve. Hi. It was so we, we traded places. I'm on the screen and you're there. It's so comfortable. I feel great. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I felt so strong. The nothingness. Mm -hmm. I felt like the emptiness. I usually don't don't see it, don't feel it, don't don't look at it. And this time, it's like if I went to the dry cleaner from the inside out, mm. and it's like reborn. Mm. It's really a very, very wonderful meditation. Thank mm. you, Eve. Sorry you're not here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think that's a really interesting reflection you know um so the kind of again potentially one could call luminous or empty nature right they're actually not different you know and that emptiness it sounds so sterile um but I'd be curious you know did the empty like how did the emptiness feel was it it enjoyable was it kind was it okay was it um yeah it was like relaxing like the most relaxing ever and uh for me not thinking all my mind is all the time yeah that's that's my life to be thinking yeah <laughs> Yeah. And just to let it go, and I feel also like my heart relaxed yeah. in my stomach. Mm. It was a, a full wash. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. You should sit up there more often, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, I think it's, you know, I think what's really interesting, um, you know, that place where we can be without thinking that we, it, like, for many of us, we don't even know that place exists, right? Like you're saying, it's just thoughts, it's just thoughts, it's just thoughts. But that place that we, and we try to avoid it, and we live in a contemporary time and culture when we can almost avoid entirely not being distracted, not something to think about. And then to discover that not all the time, but that that place can be so refreshing, like the deepest refreshment, you know, just such a sense of revitalization and energy. And it is, it's, it's really important to have that kind of direct experience um, and, and to know that and to feel it. And it really can be, um, I think a positive addiction, you know, in that it feels like, oh, wow, like, why would I go, like, why would I do that? Why would I do this? I just want to try to get there, you know, to that place of, um, yeah, peace. And it's interesting also, um, you know, many teachers, but I got to hear uh, Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche recently talking about, we actually don't need to practice compassion if we experience emptiness because from emptiness, compassion naturally arises. And you were saying that the heart was open, the belly was soft, you know, with that glimpse of emptiness, with that sense of spaciousness or awareness, the heart just already opens. There's nothing wrong with practicing compassion. We will practice compassion many times together. I, I love it, I practice it every day. And just so interesting to see that interrelationship. So thank you for sharing. Yeah. Hey, we have another question here. That's great. So during the session, you mentioned wanting to like focus on whether your breath is a short breath or a long breath. Mm. Can I understand why you mentioned this? Yeah. So we just have made our way through the Satipatthana Sutta a couple months ago, maybe just a couple weeks ago. Um, and the Satipatthana Sutta, you know, the traditional applications of mindfulness to breath and feelings and um, body, mind, mental formations. In, in that traditional teaching, there are a number of ways we apply mindfulness to the breath. And one of them is knowing the breath to be long or knowing the breath to be short. A another is simply knowing we are breathing in, knowing we are breathing out. It's just one way of helping ourselves. You know, there's a great metaphor uh, Shanti Deva uses around our mind is like a wild elephant and mindfulness is like a rope <laughs> that tethers it to a tree, right? And so we're using this kind of tether, this rope of notice the breath's length as a way to help us kind of feel that sense of uh, mindfulness. So, yeah. Can I ask uh, it, how did that, how was that for you? Or was it like surprising or kind of confusing or yeah not surprising it, it, was, it's, it was good as a reminder to pay attention to the breath duration and how long you're breathing for in between i noticed that it tends that the breath elongates as i continue the meditation it goes from mm. being short to being longer and deeper mm. and relaxing Interesting. Yeah. And again, as long as we don't get too theoretical or conceptual about it, right? Um, like, hmm, why is this happening? And I wonder if I could track this with a device. As long as we just let it be a noticing, it can be a really helpful tool for us to do that settling. You know, pretty much nothing can happen in our meditation practice if we can't learn to have some degree of settling our mind which is harder and harder, harder and harder. I mean, I think it's always been hard. I, I, I didn't live that I remember uh, 500 or a thousand years ago, so I can't compare, but I know that um, at least in the last 25 years, there's pretty good evidence to show it's harder and harder to pay attention. So this is more and more valuable. Um, and as I, I might have shared here, I've had this <clears throat> fantasy of writing a sci-fi novel where the people who practice meditation and train their attention become like the modern samurai ninja warriors 
because we're the only ones who'll be able to escape the thought control um, that will happen when they're trying to read and notice all of your thoughts, which if you can train your attention, you could avoid. So anyway. <laughs> oh, I think we have another question. Hi there, my name is Greg, and uh, thanks for leading the meditation. It is is really great. Um, I'm really new to the ecosystem of. Uh, mindfulness, meditation, Buddhism, Dharma, et cetera. And um, one thing that I'm um, kind of finding to be a challenge is um, kind of what you talked about during your preamble um, that you touched on, which was something to the effect of try not to quiet your feelings, but like try to quiet your thoughts. And I'm having difficulty sort of like like it's, it's not difficult for me to, um, sort of dismiss thoughts as they come, but I'm, I'm worried that I was becoming like numb to feelings, like as I'm, as I'm practicing that. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on the distinction between those two, actually. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. Welcome to the Dharma and welcome to the Dharma Collective. Glad you're here. Um, so yeah, it's really interesting. Um, your question so in, in this practice, just to clarify, you know, we, we don't, in the settling in, we definitely try to kind of quiet for a moment. And, and that is like, according to psychology, that would be us suppressing, right? We're, we're suppressing, we're making an effort to push away. And that can temporarily help us quiet. We wouldn't want to just practice suppression. Um, suppression does create, and this is a little bit to your point, a bit of a deadening. So when we are constantly suppressing how we feel, so many of us in our day-to-day -day life have a lot of stressful experiences in our work or with other people, and there's different strategies of how we respond to that stress or that difficulty. We can try to avoid it, never go outside, it's hard. We can um, you know, react strongly, which sometimes has difficult implications. We can suppress it in the moment and try to pretend we're not feeling it. We can observe it with mindfulness and we can also kind of reappraise and be like, okay, this is what this is, this will pass. When we suppress constantly, push down, push down, push down, it creates what's called a form of self alienation, like a distancing from our sense of self. So we actually lose touch with how we feel. So it's very well, I think, described what you were saying of, oh, wow, I don't wanna get into that trap. And in meditation or the Dharma, there's a term called equanimity. Of course, many folks here know, and it's this way of really being balanced with all of the vicissitudes of life, all the ups and downs, all the challenges, as well as um, a balance with our ability to feel compassion and care in a really unbounded way. But sometimes kind of a, a false approximation of equanimity is aloofness. So I'm not you know, I can manage the difficulty of, you know, someone I love passing away just the same way as managing someone I don't know or love passing away. And that's not true, right? It's different. Yes, we want to have equal care, but it impacts us differently. And we're inadvertently pushing down, you know, what might be our own authentic care um, in this greater idea of, of how we should or could kind of avoid that preference. Um, it's like a really windy answer, but I, I hope there's a little bit in there that's helpful. And I mean to say, practically speaking, this practice we often do here together, which is called a handshake with emotion, is a really useful practice for learning how to be with our emotion. Um, you can find that online, that meditation online easily and if you come back here, you'll absolutely practice it with us. And essentially, it's just making space for the sensation of emotion in the body without intervening, but without avoiding and suppressing. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Yeah, one more, Eve. Mm -hmm. Great questions. 
Oops. Hi, I'm Tara. Is this working? Yeah, I can hear Hi. you. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Um, oh, so I had this experience tonight where, um, yeah, it was not pleasant. It was really painful. Um, and it was like this, like cacophony in my head of like, like really uneven, really loud static. I don't mean like loud, like sound wise, but like texturally loud, like just like this, all that was going on was like this really intense static. It was really painful. It wasn't verbal. Um, and I'm, I'm in a painful place right now. Like I've been like re-experiencing some stuff like that I've already really dealt with and processed many times in my life. Um, and I'm kind of like, why am I, why do I have to feel this again? So anyway, I focused on, okay, like just experiencing this and sitting in it. And what does it feel like? I guess, mm. because the message to me is like, you fucking have to go through this again. Like, mm. I guess. So like, I just cried like the whole time, I was like so frustrated to hear everyone having these beautiful experiences, like mm -hmm. fuck all of you. Um, I was just like in pain and it was awful. Um, I mean, whatever, I'm still here or whatever, but it didn't kill me. But yeah, like, I don't know. I've never really experienced that in meditation before. And it was just this, yeah, it was disturbing. It was like falling into like this like horror escape or something wow so i'm really sorry to hear that it sounds horrible um i wish i could see you is there any way you can like so i could actually see you you there we go okay yeah and yeah I've, I've been doing this a while but not in this space so okay. yeah um and so and so i'll say a couple things that i hope are helpful and then maybe i can ask you a question or two if that works out um cool thanks yeah so i think um first of all yeah um healing is is non-linear right and and we do unfortunately recycle through things a lot um and it's really interesting when stuff resurfaces like why and what and how um sometimes we never know sometimes we have a clue as to why it's coming back again and it sounds like you are, you know, a practitioner and, you know, you know, with meditation that, uh, as Matthew Bren Silver says, meditation is a um, disorganized exposure therapy. Mm -hmm. so as we practice, stuff comes up, it gets loosened, it gets opened, it, it can arise. Um, I would say in general, it's, it's always really helpful um, to have a couple go to grounding strategies, you know, some of these trauma-informed strategies for meditation and mindfulness. And some of those include, you know, during the practice, if it becomes, you know, intense, I, I appreciate the, the courageous heart that's like, I'm going to go through it. But I think being able to titrate out and come back is also really helpful and supportive. So that could be focusing on an area that's neutral in the body, maybe like elbows or knees, that could be something really simple, like I'm going to open my eyes and just look at this one place in the room and notice all the details there. <clears throat> you know, that's brown, that's white, that's green, like just this like really supportive redirection and then coming back. So not leaving, not like, okay, I'm done. Um, if you you know want to stay in the practice, but just somewhere to kind of titrate out. It could also be, you know, that hand on the heart, hand on the face, hand on the back of the neck these areas where we know there's like some release of oxytocin sense of like self-soothing and caring um in terms of like the specifics with the static um, and, and non-verbal you know there are so many different kind of niams i don't know if you know that term n-y-a-m it's coming it, it's coming from the tibetan tradition i'm sure there's others in, in different traditions but there are these phenomena that arise in our practice that are like these knots and they come in so many weird forms, right? And it can be auditory, it can be somatic um, and they are um, really unpleasant. And there's no like specific direct way to work 
against them. It really is kind of that titration of giving yourself space and coming back. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm sorry I'm not there in person to be able to kind of give you even more direct support. Um, but I think, you know, glad that you are asking the question and, and glad, you know, you made it through. Um, but I really encourage all of us, like, don't push through um, to have these supports, you know, that we know we can go to and practice. It's really hard when a teacher is guiding you and you're like, well, I came for the practice. I should do what they said, but that's not working for me. Um, so I appreciate you bringing that up. And then, yeah, it's totally annoying when other people are having great experiences and you're not totally it happens all the time. It's like, you know, and <laughs> do you mind if I chime in? Yes. So to add a point to the previous person who just spoke, uh, I just want to help you like understand that you're probably not the only one just feeling that this didn't happen to me in today's session, but in the preceding session, I was also having things resurface from my past that I don't always enjoy having to reprocess that. I also wonder why am I reprocessing this when I spent, I'll, I'll disclose it when I spent like two years in therapy to process that. So you're not alone in this. <laughs> thank you and yeah and you know <clears throat> one thing i usually say in person but forgot because i'm not in person um and is already happening so i appreciate it but just to um you know i usually can see the room which i really can't and so i can see if there's new people um <clears throat> and want to like you know encourage and remind this kind of practice together of listening compassionately and speaking compassionately, right, for, for one another and, and with one another. And I do think um, it's so interesting to do this format of like a drop-in, right? Because we, some of us come pretty often and know each other and others don't. And, you know, also, even those of us who are coming all the time, we have different stuff going on week to week, right? Um, it's really, um, it's really challenging to, really align every week with all the ch different changes of what's happening and what allowed someone to show up this week and feel luminous emptiness and someone to feel horrific static, right? There's a lot of cause and conditions with that. So just appreciating um, the compassionate sharing and really encouraging the compassionate listening for everyone. So other questions thoughts before we get into the the theme of the evening the net of theories oh we have one more okay um well, I found really interesting. Thank you for that it was really, really good. And what I found super interesting for myself was that I 99.9% .9 of the time I am meditating with my eyes closed. Mm. So this was a new experience. And what was really interesting was that my mind was so much quieter with my eyes open mm. than it is with my eyes closed. Because yeah. I think when my eyes are closed, there's this ability to go somewhere, you know, be in my head, yeah. right? Whereas when my eyes were open, it was much less um, wandering around. I was much more present. Hmm. Thank you good for sharing to... that. Yeah. Yeah. And again, this can vary person to person. You know, I practice probably 99% of the time with my eyes open. So I, I really, I really dig it. It really works for me in, in very similar ways you're describing. Um, and again, if it's of benefit and you feel useful, I mentioned this last week, but to find a uh, opportunity to practice where there's quite a vista. So the top of a hill, you know, like Tank Hill or Bernal Mountain or just somewhere where you can see a lot and practice by allowing just the visual space to mingle with the mind. It's a really powerful practice. So thank you for sharing. Okay. So <clears throat> as I mentioned tonight, you know, it's, it's a, uh, yeah, kind of an interesting set of um, teachings and a little bit around 
how concepts or ideas or constructs can get in the way of our practice. So um, in the in the preceding chapters, there's one or two stories I'm skipping over because though I find them cute, it, it just feels a little bit of a digression away from the core teachings. And uh, just to say that there's a bit more of the Buddha engaging with children. And, and that's such a theme throughout this book. And for any of you who know Thich Nhat Hanh and his work, um, he's the translator of this text and compiler of this text. And he really prioritized children in his teaching. Uh, you know, at Plum Village, there was always children. They weren't given like a different place to practice. They were included as part of the practice. And sometimes the teachings that he offers to children, they're just so, they're so sweet. These kind of stories and fairy tales about, you know, good conduct, about virtue, um, about being a good person in the world. So that's um, one of the stories that was brought up in this last chapter. And I was mentioning last time when we were talking about post-traumatic growth and some of the stories of these nuns, these difficult stories, some of these nuns had lived through. There's, you know, more and more just about how um, the Buddha is really understanding the way to support nuns in their practice. As you may remember, I think it took 10 or 11 years for the Buddha to accept women into the Sangha. He knew that it would really disturb uh, the social um, kind of conventions of the time. He by no means believed that women weren't capable. He just was a bit politically worried about the upheaval. And he agreed to accept women in the Sangha when his own stepmother, who had raised him since he was born, walked essentially, I think it was some probably like a hundred miles on bare feet to lead with him with four other women. And um, he finally accepted. And um, as the women are also becoming more advanced practitioners and senior teachers, there's some rules that he starts to uh, understand about how to protect women um, who are on their own and there's a, a story about one very courageous nun and her meeting this young man on the road who, you know, has very ill intentions for her. And uh, she is able with her kind of forthright clarity to say, you know, do not um, pull me away from my vow. This is the most important thing in my life and able to kind of pull him out of the trance of his infatuation with her. And when this is recounted to the Buddha, he really puts into place essentially some suggestions that women are always traveling with one another and that they can have these protections because, yeah, not a safe time to be a woman on your own, even in monastic robes. So a little bit of context there. And then we meet the Buddha and he's traveling, right? So the Buddha still travels exclusively by foot. So whenever he is making his way from one of the monasteries that has been built for him in these great forests across India to another, he walks, takes a long time. It could be much faster to go by foot, but this is interesting. This is part of, I think, both his connection to a way of life that is <clears throat> at the speed of life, not faster than life. You know, I, I think about that a lot in terms of air travel and you get from one place across the world to another, but it feels like <clears throat> your spirit and soul haven't really arrived yet. You know, you're just moving so much faster than you can actually arrive. And so this way in which his whole body, heart and mind is moving at the pace that his feet can carry him. There's something so beautiful about that. And also, you know, he's not wearing shoes, this connection directly with the earth. While he has a small hut, you know, the only buildings in these monasteries are just a, a, a temple hall that's covered for the rain, you know, this deep connection with the natural world. So we catch up with the Buddha and some of his um, senior students and younger students. Um, and as they're walking, um, they, uh, da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. So when the Buddha departed from the mangoes grove, he went to Nalanda, accompanied by a large number of bhikkhus. They all walked slowly and mindfully, each of them observing their breath. And behind the bhikkhus were the monks, traveled two ascetics, Supiyo and his disciple Brahmada. They spoke in loud voices about the Buddha and his teaching. Supiyo criticized and ridiculed the Buddha. Oddly enough, his disciple 
countered his statements by commenting, um, by commending the Buddha and his teaching. The disciple spoke eloquently and convincingly to his teacher, moving the bhikkhus who could not help but hear the conversation behind them. So, um, yeah, that evening, you know, everyone actually was together. They're all the um, supiyo who had ridiculed the Buddha and the Buddha and his uh, monks were all there together. <clears throat> and the next morning, the bhikkhus were all discussing amongst themselves uh, about this conversation. And the Buddha overheard them and he said, Bhikkhus, whenever you hear someone criticize or ridicule me or the Dharma, do not give rise to feelings of anger, irritation, or indignation. Such feelings can only harm you. Whenever you hear someone praise me or the Dharma, do not give rise to feelings of happiness or pleasure or satisfaction. That too will only harm you. The correct attitude is to exam examine the criticism and see what parts may be true and what parts may not be true. Only by doing that, we have a chance to further your studies and make real progress. Most people who praise Buddha and Dharma and Sangha possess only superficial understanding. They appreciate how the bhikkhus lead chaste, simple, serene lives, but they don't see beyond that. Those who have grasped the most subtle and profound depths of the Dharma speak few words of praise. They understand the true wisdom of enlightenment. Such wisdom is profound, sublime and marvelous. It transcends all ordinary thoughts and words. I just love that, hum that humility, right? And, um, you know, I think it's very simple, wise wisdom, you know, to not hold on to criticisms, not give way to blame, but to understand and look at what is this criticism? Is there any merit in it? What can I learn from it? But this idea, which is really, you know, it's an interesting um, cultural clash with the way that contemporary meditation and mindfulness shows up in, in modern culture, that the people who really understand it, they won't praise it. They won't be, you know, um, uh, kind of saying, yo, meditation's so awesome. Like the Buddha and the Dharma, oh, it's so wonderful. Um, that in fact, it it becomes so profound and sublime. It transcends ordinary thoughts and words. And I, I find that really beautiful. Um, some of you who maybe have practiced with more traditional folks, um, monks and um, other teachers, there's a lot of humility, a lot of humility. Sometimes the humility is actually, it's gotten in the way um, of these teachers being treated seriously. You know, like, oh, I don't know anything. I'm just a simple monk. It's like the most common phrase you hear out of the Dalai Lama's mouth all the time. And just this kind of, no, I don't, I don't really know anything. I don't know much. Um, it's funny, I was at an event and um, there was a lot of uh, folk gathered interested in meditation and the Dharma and some people were new and some people were um, maybe more seasoned. And there was a, a teacher, uh, some of you may know, uh, Gil Fronsdale, who runs the Insight um, Retreat Center in Redwood City. Just such a beautiful teacher of the Dharma and really generous. Um, he has so many resources online for free and um, just such a wisdom holder. I've gotten to sit on retreat with him. And I was yeah. same table as him. And there was a very eager younger person there who had just become a yoga teacher and was so excited to talk to Gil, who she didn't had no idea who he was about her new yoga practice and how she was learning mindfulness of breathing and spent 20 or 30 minutes just kind of expounding how great it was, how wonderful. Um, and he just so humbly like listened <laughs> totally <laughs> intently, you know, obviously would have had so much to share um, if he'd been asked. And uh, it was just, you know, it was like such an example of this, you know, profound humility and, and something so admirable. And yet, we live in a modern marketplace and a lot of these teachings and a lot of teachers in order to make a living, you do kind of have to sell it. Um, and it is, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's a, it's a hard, um, it's hard to kind of have both of those ideals and, you know, who knows if the Buddha would have been on TikTok in our modern culture. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Um, I kind of don't think so, but I really don't know. Um, 
but it is, you know, it's, it's hard to know how to, um, how to share these teachings in a way that makes sense for people and how to have people interested and excited. But I really just, I, I love this idea that, you know, if people want to talk poorly about it or um, <clears throat> want to criticize, you know, like no, no problem. And, you know, it's interesting. <clears throat> Meditation has certainly become more mainstream or at least mindfulness has, but dedicating your life to the Dharma is, is still <laughs> definitely not mainstream right? Putting, you know, at the center of, in some ways, your life, your practice, um, that is still something that would be hard to talk to people about. And I don't think it would um, benefit to kind of overclaim the benefit, you know, overclaim. This is so amazing. It's so wonderful. I love it. It's the best thing. So yeah, it's a kind of an interesting conundrum that practitioners can get in that I like him bringing up. Um, any thoughts or reflections or questions on just that section of this teaching does this resonate for anyone feel familiar yeah ben nice to see you hey um okay i'm gonna lower my hand so i don't forget to do that um yeah wow like um this is sort of a response riff or whatever on on like what you just said eve like uh i really don't um i have a hard time trusting people who i feel are trying to sell something and so it's quite and i think that there's uh that's for very good reason um that reason doesn't always apply but it applies frequently it apply it frequently is the correct thing the correct caution to have and you know i've i've been mm, i often find myself conflicted mm. because you know i live close to a buddhist center that frankly i can't afford to really go to much <laughs> and um and uh and and then like You know, I do want to actually connect with teachers and um, boy, my 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 words are, are not particularly eloquent tonight, but some of the book titles I've seen, I like read them like, OK, this author is dead to me. And, uh, <laughs> you know, if I see a book called uh, what was it? Mindful is the New Skinny, real title. Uh, and it, boy, it's it's I try to hold. I try to hold a, a a more nuanced understanding of ah this person may actually care about the right stuff but have to do this in a capitalist world. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I I have a really hard time because like I I uh sort of like detest the corruption that <laughs> that capitalism forces on otherwise sincere people. Uh and also like that 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 trust issue kind of I get why it's there. It also makes it harder to find peers, uh, find teachers, find community uh, of like, you know, sincere practitioners. Yeah. I don't know. Just yeah. rambling a little bit. I no. wanted to say that. Thank you. Yeah. No, <laughs> thank you for sharing. It is, I mean, it's, it's hard. And then it's hard to not feel contempt, right. And judgment. And, um, and I love that reframe. Maybe this is what this person needs to do in this capitalist culture, you know, and I think that's right. Um, there is, you know, quite a marketplace and, and yeah, it's interesting. I think it would be, we'll hopefully look back on this epoch of self selling and um, find it funny. Um, it's already funny. Mindful is new skinny. Um, and, you know, and I also, I really hope um, for myself and others that when there is, when there are compromises that are made in order to extend and expand the Dharma towards people who wouldn't otherwise find it, that some good is happening. Often it has to be distilled, right? It becomes a little bit less maybe um, rich in its essence, but I think obviously we need by any means necessary more kindness and wisdom in this world. So I hope that there are audiences for Mindful is the New Skinny. 
and who become, <laughs> you know, truly um, more kind to themselves and others. And yeah, mm -hmm. so I, yeah, appreciate your reflection. Yeah. Any other, any other thoughts? This from folks. Hey. hey, you guys, Ben, it's good to see you. Um, when when that idea came up, when you brought up that idea of um, people expounding upon the Dharma or, you know, even proselytizing the Dharma, it just cracked me up. I mean, it's it, it is it's 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 kind of funny. That idea is sort of funny. And but I I was really struck with the um, almost the warning of watch out for those folks. There, there's a lack of sincerity there, and um, or there's or, or maybe if, if if it's not actually a lack of sincerity, maybe there's just some confusion there. Mm. Or and. Um, and that 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 really struck me. So I'm 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 glad that that came up in the discussion of the the reading tonight. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We have a, a couple more. Eve. Okay. I think Tammy. Hello, Eve. I may have missed it, but I was wondering if you could clarify the connection you made to what you talked about at the beginning of class about the relationship from, between that story and getting really attached to stories about yeah. ourselves. No, that's the next part of what I was going to read, and I'm not sure we're going to get there. Mm -hmm. So you're definitely paying attention, but we might. There's only a couple lines. Yeah. Oh, I want to get to the next part of the story. All right. <laughs> I'll go quick here. Um, it's such good questions here. Okay. So then um, he says, bhikkhus, there are countless philosophies and doctrines and theories in this world. People criticize each other and argue endlessly over their theories. According to my investigation, there are 62 main theories that underlie the thousands of philosophies and religions current in our world. Look at, um, looked at from the way of enlightenment and emancipation, all 62 of these theories contain errors and create obstacles. The Buddha proceeded to explain the 62 theories and expose their errors. He spoke on the 18 theories concerning the past, the four theories of eternalism, the four theories of partial eternalism, the four theories of finitude and infinity, and the four theories of endless equivocation, and the two theories that claim causality does not exist. He spoke about the 44 theories that concern the future. 16 allege the soul lives on after death. Eight say there are no souls after death. Eight that posit there neither is a soul that continues after death nor ceases to continue after death. Seven nihilistic theories and five theories that say the present is already nirvana. Bhikkhus, don't fall into that bewitching net. You will only waste time and lose your practice. Use your chance to practice the way of enlightenment. Don't fall into the net of mere speculation. All these beliefs and doctrines have arisen because people have been led astray by perceptions and feelings. When mindfulness is not practiced, it is impossible to see the true nature of perceptions and feelings. When you can penetrate the roots and see the true nature of your perceptions and feelings, you will see the impermanent and interdependent nature of all dharmas you will no longer need to be caught in the net of desire, anxiety, and fear, the net of 62 false theories. Pretty profound. Uh, we're going to have to unpack it uh, a bit more, but it's just, I have to admit, I spent quite a bit of time on Wikipedia and other sites looking at these 62 theories and their contemporary equivalencies. And, you know, suffice to say, there's nothing inherently wrong with all of them, but what's missing is the direct practice. Is this relevant for me? Does this relate to my way of living or is this a theory? You know, it's, it's essentially creating another identity structure 
oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I have bad attachment, right? Which is like, I'm an insecurely attached person. I can admit that. But if I identify with that as who I am, without investigating how I can shift and change and grow moment to moment, it calcifies this identity of someone with insecure attachment. So anyway, it just really struck me, um, this net of theories and the way we can get caught in stories. We will talk about it more next time. So um, I'm going to be on retreat next week. I mean, not really. Like, it's going to be so hard. <laughs> honest. Retreat is so hard. Um, but I'm very, really grateful um, to be sitting with my teacher, Sangha, and um, Charlotta from... Paramandala will be with us for Feeding Your Demons next week. So always a nice interlude. And then we'll come back um, to talk a bit more about these theories. And actually, there's a really nice in the next chapter. Um, by the way, we're on chapter 61. Um, there, we're going to get back again, almost to the beginning of dependent co-arising, which I think it's the essence, it's the pith. And there's like another beautiful teaching. So we get to return to that. So let's take a moment to dedicate the merit of our practice together. So returning this inner gaze. And taking a moment and noticing sensations in the body. Noticing the quality of mind. Maybe the mind feels busy, excited. Maybe the mind feels connected or inspired. Whatever is present, just taking a moment and connecting inward. And then as we shift to dedicate the merit of this practice, bringing palms together at the heart, just symbolic offering with this full intention that our practice here together to be of benefit, not only to ourselves, but for all beings, that all beings could know peace and ease, that all beings could know their true nature, that all beings could be liberated from samsara and experience genuine happiness. 